so there's a few seats up here. If, there, if you'd like to come, I'm looking at certain people. <laughs> okay. We're lonely up here. There's more space. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Jamie Isaac, uh, Chief Curator of um, the Gallery of Greater Victoria. Uh, we want to first off um, uh, by acknowledging the land we are. The Art Gallery of Greater Victoria is located on the traditional territories of the Lukungan peoples, today known as uh, Esquimalt and Songhees Nations. Uh, we extend our deep appreciation uh, for the opportunity to live, work, and thrive on these lands. And uh, today, really be um, welcoming these amazing artists um, that are the recipients of the 2021 Governor General Awards for the Visual and Media Arts. Uh, we are in partnership with this exhibition, of course, with Canada Council, who is uh, delivering and um, delivering the general Governor General Awards for the last 22 years, is it? Um, pretty amazing um, opportunity to host this exhibition. So uh, I will be passing the mic down. And because there is such an amazing panel of amazing minds, um, we could be here all day uh, listening to their amazing practices and lifetime achievements. However, we have an hour, um, so we wanted to do a bit of a time frame um, uh, and framework where it's a bit like um, everyone's going to be speaking for about eight minutes, showing their slides. And then um, we will have about 20 to 30 minutes following that to have a discussion and ask questions. So if we could hold our questions until after everyone speaks, that would be really great. And um, if you have a, a burning question, write it down so you don't forget it. And, and then we can have a great discussion. So uh, without further ado, I will start off with uh, Luc Crochin. So the work I'm presenting here to, uh we try to be hardware agnostic when we work like that because uh, technology changes every minute, you know, every every month, every year. So the work you did uh, using a particular operating system three years ago will not play necessarily in three years. So you have to upgrade, adapt, uh, repair, change libraries. So, but hopefully the idea, the concept is uh, stronger, more interesting than the technology you use to implement it. So, uh, but at the same time, it's much cheaper to restore a digital artwork than to restore an oil painting on, on 15th century wood panels. So, but institutions, museums and galleries uh, have not come to get that yet. But I think uh, there's an opportunity when you hire technicians or curators or registers to make sure that they are, that they, uh, they are not close to technology, that they understand a little bit how it works, so that if something happens, they can, you know, they will not freak out, they will just look at it coldly, and if they can uh, do things to make it work better, then do it. Or otherwise, like, there are a lot of resources around, especially among the young people who are more familiar with technology than we are. Uh, so the work that is presented here is um, uh, is, a, is a space actually. One of my, the thing I realized that, uh, in my uh, artistic uh, career so far is that um, the artist toolbox. My real project is to build a toolbox, and with this tool, I try to formalize the ideas I have. Like Dempsey, for example, had his toolbox has you know probably hammers and knives and all kinds of things, and his material is wood. Mine has you know cameras. Like the, the, my phone is the best camera I had. I have a spherical camera in my pocket. I have a little book here with a pencil. I can write ideas. Uh, sometimes I have fancy equipment, but I rent them or find somebody who owns them can operate them. But the the the, the equipment I use is. Um, I'm trying to harvest from the world around me images and sounds mm -hmm. and then uh, to try to uh, put them together in a space that can be explored. 
So one of the things that I discovered in, in, in this, in, through these years is that my uh, toolbox uh, using uh, tools like computers and, and cameras and microphones is basically uh, tools to create space. Computer is creating a space. So how do I want to build a space in which I invite people? And I was always, uh, I love paintings, I love museums, you know, uh, but for me, I, I, I would not feel, uh, would not feel uh, competent to, to make a painting. I see, when I see a frame, I want to enter, I want the frame to become a door. So I say, what if I can contribute to the development of art and culture and ideas, for me, the frame becomes a door and I want to enter and I, if I enter that painting, you know, I can sort of imagine it in 3D. I can imagine like going, some fields are transparent. I go beyond them. I look at it from behind. So this is what I'm trying to do. My material are photographs, they're videos. They're like the things you do with these simple tools. But I try to arrange them to create a sort of garden of sound and images and transparencies and a place where it's not a game. You know, I'm using game engines to put this together and let you navigate through it, but it's not a game. The game, it would just be to hang around, look at something that grabs your attention. Why? I don't know. Maybe something that speaks to you at one point. Uh, you stop, you spend some time with it, and then you move on. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, what in, my, in my former life, uh, I was an exhibition designer. That was my, my job. And I made exhibitions in museums with curators in general, or, uh, or uh, if it was a museum of, uh, for example, uh, archaeology or a museum of, of, of civilization, you make thematic exhibitions. So you have, a, you have a, a story to tell, you have objects and you know, artifacts to position in space. And the pleasure was to work with the architecture to tell a story as people wandered through a more or less, you know, a predefined path. Mm -hmm. So I can do exactly the same today with my uh, head-mounted display, except the space is unlimited. The object don't need to be secure. You know, I just put an object there and uh, nobody's going to steal it or scratch it or destroy it. Uh, I can have, I have 1,000, at least 1,000 assets in this world. And then uh, once I position them, I can change the way they they are positioned, so I change the architecture. So if you go in there, you will see, uh, re look at through the instruction carefully, you have a button uh, where you can select four different architectures for these assets. So one is sequential, so every object uh, is positioned based on, on its timestamp. So if an object was created in 1972, it will be there on the timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, are more recent will be closer to us. So there's a very linear, very uh, simplistic conception of time there, where the past, you know, is in the, this way, the future is there, and I'm moving along, you know, this timeline. Another organization is by category. So all the objects have little handles which say, okay, I am a photograph, or I am a 3D object, or I am a portrait of somebody, or I have this color. So when you pick uh, uh, the, the word is a radio, everything is already organized by category. And suddenly you see all the objects, the thousand objects move around you and settle in that mode. And then you can still explore, you know, go around. They're a bit jammed together, but that's, it's interesting to see how suddenly uh, uh, the, 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 you can make with the same uh, corpus of assets, you can say something different. And it goes along with today's uh, uh, necessity to, 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 to understand that our points of views are relative, you know, we're subjective. The way I look at the world is different from, from your way because of my culture, of my age, of my language maybe. So that's a way to express that. So I'm just at the beginning of finding different ways to express things. The third thing is random. It's just the computer is given very simple principles like, okay, every object will be in this relationship with one another, like 90 degree angle, some will be bigger, some will be smaller. So very simple rules. And then uh, this mode will create every time something different, but it creates very interesting accidents. That's my favorite actually, because you know suddenly this video, it's next to this word or this picture. And you say, oh, that's interesting. You, it, may, it creates relationships and it makes you think. So this is the fun I have as a creator. And I hope that it's also interesting for 
uh, people uh, like you experiencing it. I'm not sure yet, you know, uh, the work I'm showing here it was never shown before exactly the way it's shown here. Mm -hmm. And next time it will still be a bit different. So I'm learning from each exhibition on how to play with that. But for me, the, the medium is is very, very uh, sort of challenging and, and fun to work with. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Amy Gogarty, and along with Rain Mackay, the director of the Craft Council of BC, I had the very great honor of nominating Lou Lin for the 2021 Sadie Brothman Governor General's Award. I would like to begin by telling you a little bit about Lou. Born in Edmonton, Alberta, Lou Lin studied at a number of institutions, including the University of Alberta, the Oregon College of Art and Craft, the Honolulu Academy of Arts, and recognizing her affinity for glass, between 1985 and 2009, she undertook studies at the Pilchuck Glass School in Stanwood, Washington, later returning as a teacher and mentor. The work for which she is best known, sculptures based on household tools constructed from bronze and glass, has been exhibited across Canada and in China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Denmark, and the USA. She has participated in 20 solo exhibitions and nearly 100 group exhibitions. She has received numerous BC Arts and Canada Council grants, scholarships, awards of excellence, and reviews. Her work can be found in private, public, and corporate collections, including the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery, the Glass Museum in Denmark, and the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. She has been featured in over 40 journal articles, in radio interviews, videos, over 15 catalogs, and in three books. In 2006, she received the Gerson Award for Excellence, Innovation, and Leadership from the Craft Council of BC. And in 2010, she was inducted into the Royal Canadian Academy of Art. Lulin lives in Winlaw, BC, a very tiny, lovely rural town outside Nelson, BC where she has facilities for working in glass, as well as all manner of metalworking, with the exception of bronze casting. She has developed skills in glass fusing, kiln casting, sand casting, blowing, sandblasting, lamp working, and integrating industrial plate glass and found glass objects into her work. As her work grew in technical complexity, she added skills relating to casting aluminum and later bronze. The trajectory of her career events as a continual development and refinement of her technical skill and artistic vision. Throughout, she has focused on the iconic forms of tools and other functional objects. These attract her for the relationship to craft and human culture, emphasizing what craft historian Howard Rizzotti has described as the relationship between tools and the human hand, which is the very basis of craft. In many ways, Lynn thinks of her work in terms of the archaeology of everyday life. She collects antique tools, admiring them for the beauty of their forms and for their archaeological interest. The tools she makes, however, are impossible. They will never be used. Combining the strength of bronze with the fragility of glass, her abstract forms exaggerate and expand the notion of the tool, yet they speak to the mind and the imagination rather than to any pressing task. Many of Lu Lin's tools appear to be fragments of larger machines. Although obscure as to their original purpose, these works are characterized by precision, attention to detail, and finish. For her series Utensils, 2011-2012, Lin turned her collection of antique kitchen tools for inspiration. This series is based on hand tools that have largely been replaced by electric gadgets in modern kitchens. The large sculptural works combine bronze and glass to commemorate skills essential to the survival of the human race and, interestingly, to tasks most often performed by women. Reflecting Lynn's interest in formal and functional qualities of antique, industrial, and utilitarian trade tools, the series Implements and Objects, 2004 to the present, consists of individual objects of bronze and glass. These objects reflect the artist's interest in work performed by a variety of tradespeople, including carpenters, shipwrights, shoemakers, and gardeners. Objects such as the berry scoop are large in scale. Although their function might not be apparent, they convey gravitas, 
and they encourage us to rethink our collective history. The intricately curved, textured, and polished bronze components emphasize the beauty of the material and contrast with the luminous glass. Works that never fail to attract attention are her shovels, each of which has a unique shape, the exact function of which is obscure. Pairing the tough, sculpted bronze blade and handle with the sparkling glass shaft creates a tool that appears at once practical, magical, and impossible. For nearly 40 years, Lu Lin has pursued excellence in craftsmanship, mastery of relevant technologies and materials, attention to all aspects of production and presentation, and a lifelong interest in the tools and implements associated with the history of handcraft and making. Her long career gives evidence of a unique personal artistic vision and sophisticated aesthetic language. Coordinating the virtues of hand, mind, and body, she has created beautiful objects that enrich our world. I cannot conclude without mentioning that in addition to being an outstanding artist, Lu Lin has contributed immensely to the development of fine craft through her dedication as an ed educator, mentor, and advocate for craft. She has co-authored two books on glass, lectured widely, and taught in Canada, the US, Scotland, and China. For over 20 years, she taught professional practices at the Kootenai School of the Arts in Nelson, BC, informing young artists about skills required to succeed in their chosen field. Recognizing the importance of marketing to career success, she has lectured widely about this often overlooked field of endeavor, conducting workshops especially designed for First Nations artists and coordinating conferences addressing craft marketing. She has curated exhibitions for public galleries, served on juries, and sat on numerous boards and advisory committees. Lu Lin is an exemplary model of the citizen artist committed to her artistic practice and to the betterment of her community. It is entirely fitting, in my opinion, that she has been awarded the 2021 C.D. Bronfman Governor General Award in Visual and Media Arts. I've never been to Victoria before. I've only seen the Pacific Ocean once before. I come from the Great Lakes. My people are the Anishinaabe um, of Lake Huron. I live in Toronto on Lake Ontario. My work has been hugely informed by the place that I come from, and particularly by the waters that surround my home. Um, the work that I'm showing upstairs in the gallery is a piece that I made in 2013. It's called Treaty Robe for Tecumseh. I wanted to talk about treaty um, about the way that Canada was formed by agreements between Indigenous peoples and colonial peoples that had to do with sharing and access to land and to resources. And I wanted to talk about the degradation of those treaties over time, particularly during the period between 1763 and 1813, pivotal, pivotal era in our country's history, pivotal era in the history of the Indigenous people, because it was during that period that the land went from being shared among us as equals, as beneficiaries of the great bounty of this place, to being completely lost. And I'm a sculptor, I'm an installation artist, and I have these stories inside. And what I try to do with my work is find a way to tell a very complex story in a object. Unlike Luke, I don't take a library of images that you can travel through and construct a narrative. The narrative is clear already. We know the history. We should know the history. What I find out, of course, is we don't know the history. The history has been hidden 
It has been withdrawn from our um, grasp. And we are the poorer because we don't have a hold of our history. And so gradually over the years, my life and my work has come to be about trying to grab that history back. Because I believe that only when we have knowledge of what occurred can we begin the work of repairing what, what, was, what was wrong about that. What I like to do is take materials of different kinds and use their complexity and also their simplicity to help me to construct uh, that narrative. So in this piece, I took a, um, a Union Jack. This Union Jack was flown on a uh, battleship in uh, the Second World War. And I found it in a uh, consignment store. It was hanging in the window. Uh, it's from 1943. So this Union Jack has seen battle on the ocean. And this was really important for me because the story is about Tecamse. And Tecamse was a warrior too. And he saw battle all around the Great Lakes. He was fighting for a homeland, just as in 1943, that battleship was fighting. And I felt that somehow that, just like your, your images, they would tell a story. That flag has a story to tell of its own. It, it's completely separate from what I want to tell. But together with the objects that I bring as well, we can create something that maybe approximates truth. I used uh, beads as well. So I used nickel beads. Nickel because it is the uh, substance of the Canadian shield where I grew up. I used brass to make those belts. Uh, brass beads. When, if you lift them up, you'll find how heavy they are. We lifted them yesterday mm -hmm. to, to install that work. Um, these are heavy. Why are the treaties heavy? Because they are meaningful to us. Because they carry that trust between us. And they carry the heart of us that went into that trust. And it is important for us, at least in my view, that we acknowledge those treaties and that we recognize that Canada was founded on those treaties. Without them, the land, certainly the land that I come from um, would be constructed very, very differently. So they're heavy, they're laborious, they're stitched every one, every bead, quietly and patiently together to describe the gradual erosion of that trust between us and the gradual erasure of those um, indigenous lands and waters. I, I could go on and describe for you in more detail, but I think there's a, there's a panel there that that talks about um, how these three treaties that are um, that that Tecumseh is, dra is dragging behind him document the um, elimination of all indigenous land around the Great Lakes. My friend Lillian made a short video. It's an overview of my work. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm, we're going to. Uh, play that right now, um, but I, I, I should say that I've been involved in two communities all my life, the Japanese Canadian community and the art, artist community. And my activities and projects in these two communities have run through my life in parallel pretty well. And sometimes they get to cross over and blend and it's um, 
particularly gratifying when that happens. Uh, all the while I've made art, um, and I wrote this description of what I do years ago, but I think it still holds true. I said, in my personal work, um, and it kind of explains the eclecticism of my work. In my personal work, I like it when I can combine two or more of the following. Japanese Canadianness, abstract expressionism, Hamilton, the city by where I live, um, literature and a sense of communality. I want them to be gracefully awkward combinations and surprising encounters. I would like to acknowledge the artists that came before me and the ones that will come after me. I'm a high-tech storyteller. And that's a term my mentor, the late James Luna, coined back in the day. Um, I guess the work, oh, it's so tiny. <laughs> I want to talk about is this work. Um, the work that's in the show is four videos of performances from 1998 until 2007. Um, but this new work I did, I did a residency at Wanuskewin, which is a heritage park in Saskatchewan, where I'm from. I'm from Treaty 4. My mother was, my late mother was Korean Soto. My father was Métis, hence Blondo. <laughs> and... Wanuskewin is a place outside of Saskatoon that's become a heritage park. It's waiting for its Nesesco, uh des world designation, which we'll be excited when it gets it. But it's where the Cree people um, would gather, and there's five bison jumps. And so I was invited to do a residency in the summer. And two years ago, they reintroduced the bison back to this land where they had lived for millennial. And the bison that they reintroduced were from two different herds. 
Because in Saskatchewan, we have, in Grasslands National Park and Prince Albert National Park, they are some of the 100% DNA bison. Yellowstone also has another herd that's 100% because, you know, not all bison's full <laughs> DNA. <laughs> I guess they mix them with cows or something at some point. Anyway, so they introduced the bison back to this park in January, I want to say 20, not last year. Time is so weird with COVID. <laughs> so not last January, but the January before that. Is that 20? 20, 2019. 2019. And they introduced 30. Some of them were from Yellowstone and some of them are from grasslands. And in the spring of 2020, because bison, you know, they like to get down and rub and bathe in that dirt. <laughs> and they exposed four rocks four petroglyphs. I know. <laughs> and I knew this before they told, you know, the public about it, and I had to, I couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> it's just like, it's kind of like getting this GG award. <laughs> I couldn't tell anybody for four months. And um, they were called rib stones, so it was like um, the hunters when they would you know, killed the bison. It was markings for every bison that was killed. And then I just found out on International Indigenous Day on September 30th, there was a baby bison born. There was one born on Mother's Day, one born on June 21st, and now one born on September. Um, so this residency, I just wanted to honor the bison. And I was thinking about how our, our people, our contemporary Indigenous people, we use ribbon. And we use it for ownership, celebration, like ribbon skirts, ribbon shirts. And I had, I, so for me, this is honoring the bison being returned to their homeland after being gone for, I don't know, almost 200 years. And, it was just magical to be there. This is the South Saskatchewan River. Um, the other work I have, um, the big photos are of, I call it a square on um, Lake Winnipeg. Uh, and that I was commissioned to do that work for an opera, for Tapestry Opera, and it was for a play that was written about Shwana did it, the last, they say the last of the Boda people, but I don't think she was. I think they still exist. Um, and then the videos are just old. <laughs> so. I was thinking about what I'm going to say, but these guys said it all. <laughs> um, I started working in 69, and I, I started working with Frida Deasing from in Prince Rupert. And, you know, like when I started, I didn't say I was going to be an artist. And my friend Tommy Reese bugged me to go carving with him. But I drew all my life since I was a kid. And uh, we used to make our own toys because we had no money. And um, we used to look at the Simpson Sears wish book catalog. <laughs> see a gun in there and draw it and carve it. And we made slingshots and bow and arrows and anyways, my good friend Bob Jackson, one day we were sitting down by the, we made these canoes and we were playing in this puddle and with the canoes. And he asked me what I was going to be and I, I said, I think I'm going to be a carpenter because my dad was a carpenter and I used to watch him working with the wood. And I used to watch him when he was carving the kindling, like, you know, they used to make these with a knife, these round shapes. To start the fire in the morning really fast. And uh, anyway, so 
later on, like I, me and Bob Jackson, we we had this pact, we, we, we had this agreement. So he said, we're gonna do something. We didn't know what it was, but we're gonna do it. And he said, uh, what we agreed on was, we're gonna do something with our lives. We're gonna do something. The only rule, it's gotta be good. <laughs> 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 At one time, he quit carving, and I said, remember what we agreed on? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, are you going to do it? And he said, well, uh, I thought God gave you this gift, and he didn't give it to everybody. <laughs> so he started carving again. <laughs> but he was one of the best carvers, and I was lucky, like, I, I met Frida, and I was ready t to learn. And because you can't, you can't just go there. You have to be committed. And what I found is like, you know, like with art and teaching and you can't just have talent. You gotta have the commitment, the dedication. <laughs> That's what's costly. Like there's a lot of talent in the world, but it's all wasted. Well, not all, but most of this. <laughs> but, you know, I was lucky that I met really good teachers and and I was ready to learn and willing to do whatever it takes. And I didn't go to art school, but I studied it myself. Like people ask me and I said, I went to art school at the Prince Rupert Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> but I know all that and I, I wanted to know what good art was. And um, I was always willing to learn. And I found too that like to be a true artist, you have to continuously learn and use it because you don't even use 10% of what you know in your whole life. And what I'm trying to do now is put what I know in, into my pieces, into my sculpture. And that's what I'm doing now with my new pieces. And um, I'm working on a show now about the canneries because I realized we're the last First Nations cannery generation that lived there, worked there, fished there, you know, like, and, uh, there's no more canneries. And the canneries have been running in, in Northern BC for over a hundred years. And our people were always involved, First Nations. So what I wanna do, I wanna make a statement about that. And also I wanna make a statement about the, we're losing our salmon, like the buffalo, you know, like that's our buffalo, <laughs> you know, because you know, like all the animals that depend on it and, um, so that's that's what I'm working on now. I'm working on a show about the cannery days. I'm going to call it the cannery days, the glory days. Because <laughs> everyone I talked to, they said it was the best time of their lives working in the cannery. Because everybody had a job. We didn't have lots of money, but we had a job. <laughs> and, you know, like when I was growing up, my mother worked there, my grandfather worked there, my, my dad worked there, my sisters, my cousins, my aunties, everybody. <laughs> everybody worked there. And we worked, you know, like with Japanese people, Chinese people, and everybody worked there. And I want to make a statement about that too. And that's that's the project I'm working on now, because I'm thinking about like, like say like with Northwest Coast, you know, they always try to put us in categories, but we don't fit. <laughs> because Northwest Coast is the own, one of the only true great art forms that's from Canada. It's not from somewhere else. It didn't come from across the ocean. It's from here. And it's ours. And it's one of the, our ancestors did some of the greatest sculptures of any time and any place. And that's what I feel about our, my ancestors. And that's what I realized studying it. I've studied the art now for 50 years. And I've taught and, and, and worked at it. And that's where I've been working at it like now over 50 years. And I think about it now, like, like where would it have gone if they didn't stop us? And like saying like our generation, when I grew up, we weren't, a, when I was born, my people weren't allowed to carve our, 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 oh, 
our culture was outlawed till 1951. So my generation, uh, it was a rebellion about what they did to our people. So I think culture is so important and art because when you understand art, you understand culture. Culture is what makes us human. Culture is, makes us civilized. That's why art is important. And art is like, you know, like, like culture is like the glue of societies. It's a spiritual glue of societies. And once that breaks down, the whole nation breaks down. And, you know, like, you've got to know your history, though. You've got to know your history and you've got to try to deal with it. And, and that's what I've been thinking about the art, how, how it affected my life, how it affects other people. But people think that, you know, art is just paintings and drawings and stuff. It's whatever you do. That's your culture. Whatever you live, that's your culture. And what I've been trying to do is show that, you know, Northwest Coast, our cult, our, our art, it's great art. It's great art. And I've been pushing that my whole life because my grandmother said, you got to do it well. Because when we show our face, which means our designs, our clans, our society is matrilineal. My mother is wolf. I'm wolf. My grandfathers are ravens. We don't marry the same clan, but we take it from our mother's side. And I was lucky because I was born in the right family. My, my grandmother's father was a carver from Huna, Alaska. His name was Judson Ward. And then I found out that my great grandmother was a basket weaver. So I was lucky that art was in my family way back. And also my grandfathers, they were singers and song composers and storytellers and healers. So the art was in my family and I was lucky when I was young, I listened. I listened to my grandfather. And but when you're young, you think you know it all too, you know, and I, I should have listened more. <laughs> I used to tell my grandpa, you know, <laughs> you know, I know that, I know that. And he says, well, you're going to find out. He said, you learn it now, or you're going to find out the hard way. Now I got to find out the hard way. <laughs> but I'm very thankful, you know, for my, for my teachers and, uh, and I'm honored to get this award, you know, because it's, it's for our ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. It's for my mother, yeah. my grandmother, my grandfather. And they were the only ones that believed in me <laughs> when I started. It's for my people. I just want to thank everybody too. And um, I thought about my mom when I got this. And when they phoned me up, you know, they said, she said to me, but when I won this award, she said to me, I won this award. And um, I said, oh, thank you. I said, it only took me 50 years. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I started to laugh. You know. But that's how long it took. <laughs> And one of, one of our students said to me one day that in two years I'm going to be Dempsey Bob. And I thought about it and thought, oh, <laughs> it took me 50. <laughs> and I'm still trying to be Dempsey Bob. <laughs> but you know what I feel too is like, you know, like for a true artist, you got to keep learning. Mm. You stop learning, you finish. You don't get any better, you don't get any worse, but you actually finished. But you got to use what you know. You have to use what you know. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work now. I'm thinking about our, my ancestors now. Where would they have gone if they didn't stop? If they didn't stop carving? And we got to go there. There's nowhere else to go. Because like I've talked about, like people always talk about, well, is that traditional or is it contemporary? 
When you think about art, everything was one time contemporary. Mm -hmm. It's the acceptance, the use of the people that make it traditional. Mm -hmm. And it's the great pieces that have a chance of becoming traditional. And I talk about like, like, like right now, I talk with my friends, the Maoris, I've been working with them. Like, cause like, like when we go back in our time, back south, okay, I'm gonna hit the wall. And that's the great wall, the wall of my ancestors, great art. Now, how the hell am I gonna get over it? Or around it, or <laughs> under it, or beside it, or? You can't. You cannot get, it, get there. We, what we decided was, all we can do is do our very, very best, use what we know, use everything we know, and everything we can borrow or steal, and we have to do it for our own time. And that's all we can do. Because that's what they did in their time. <laughs> that was their art for their time. And that's what we're dealing with now. And that's what I'm dealing with now. And so what I've been trying to do is like with my work, I did the wall sculptures like, and um, I thought about like, 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 I want to put the sculptures on the wall. And that's what I call them, they're wall sculptures. Because it's not a totem pole, it's not a mask. It's a wall sculpture. And I've done pieces, you know, and people said, well, I did this little frog guy, I had this little froggy guy, you know, and I used to carry him around like my little baby, you know. And anyways, this lady says to me, she says, that's not Northwest Coast. And I said, what do you mean? I said, I did him. <laughs> and she says, well, it's not a totem pole. I said, well, it's not a totem pole, it's a sculpture, you know. <laughs> she thinks we only done totem poles, you know. <laughs> anyways. So I done a lot of different things and I was lucky too, like I, I had good teachers and I listened and I, I, I worked hard too. I, I worked hard and I realized, you know, you got to use what you know too. You can't just learn it. And I actually done my homework, like, because what happens is like, I done my homework in art by teaching. I taught in Alaska, I taught in Yukon, I taught in the jails. I, I went everywhere. And, and, uh, and I, like, I didn't want to, when I started, I just wanted to carve and Frida knew that, you know, so what she did to me, she, she sent me to Alaska to teach our, our Tlingit people, my relatives up there, drawing traditional ovoids and U-shapes. And, and then when I went up there, after I, I realized, after 10,000 old boys, <laughs> I knew how to draw. <laughs> That's why she sent me. But I realized too, like, because I was trying to get better, but I kept hitting the wall, and it was my own wall, because I didn't know how to draw. And the pieces couldn't get better. And what I find now, like, we, we named the school after her, Terrace, and, we call it Frida Deasing School of Northwest Coast Art. Because I feel she never got her full recognition because she was female. And when she started, like females, they didn't carve in our society, in our, in our culture, but they didn't even come around the carvers. But Frida was the first one to do a big totem pole up there. And she was a great teacher. And she, we were hanging on by a thread and Frida was our thread to our culture. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that. Mm -hmm. I still miss her. <laughs> but, um, you know, she sent us to Alaska to teach. And one day Phil Genzi phoned me up. He was a great jeweler, Phil Genzi. And he says, you know what? We taught for nothing when we went to Alaska. Said, well, we got paid, you know, they paid us. But you know what they did to us? They made us give us, give them carvings to teach, like at the Totem Heritage Center. I had to give them a mask. We had to give them bowls, spoons, designs, boxes. Anyways, Phil says, you know, 
now that we're known artists, those pieces are worth more than we ever got paid. <laughs> 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 so we, we, we did it for nothing. Then he said, at the end, he said, but we did it because Frida told us to do it, so we did it. And then he says, at the end, he says, we did it for the love of Frida. And we're still doing it. That's why we named school after her. Because I felt that she didn't get her full recognition as an artist. Because, well, Frida was humble too. Frida was a good teacher and a good person. That's, that's why we named school after her, so she won't be forgotten. What I would like to say is that uh, before my mother uh, was a young lady, she used to um, look after a blind lady. And she told my um, uh, mother to name after her. So they were helping each other quite a bit because there was nobody else. And uh, the old lady whose uh, name was Anatolia, uh, like my last name, she, she told my mother to name after her. And uh, I told my mother that I would have uh, very good eyes. Except that I don't have very good eyes. I have to wear pres prescription glasses. <laughs> so, and over the years, I think I started to think that it might have uh, inner sight is what I have for the artwork. Now I look at it that way. And uh, because the bay, Hudson Bay, was the first, very first uh, store up north in uh, Fortis. And uh, there is sell papers, just food, and uh, tools, hunting tools. So they didn't sell any papers. So when I was about maybe six or seven, my father would uh, do, uh, go to the store. Well, he, he had to travel. And uh, because I live uh, from uh, outside of Iglori, we lived in a camp. And uh, he used to buy a uh, little box of uh, Ridley Sparing Gums. And that's what I used to do my artwork, uh, you know, take the glue off and you have a uh, white inside. That's what I started with. And, uh, and I haven't um, stopped. Now I have good papers. <laughs> oh, one thing I have to uh, could somebody tell me when I'm up, when my eight minutes is over? <laughs> I won't be able. I'm not going to think about my eight minutes. <laughs> and, uh, I have a little bit of training. I want fun arts for almost three years, and then I got bored. <laughs> uh, and these are the, and then I got into printing for a year, one time. So I do different things over the years. 
And this is uh, one of the print. And uh, I pretty well only do lectures. I don't do anything else because I think uh, it has something to do with my father. Uh, when we were in bed, we used to ask him to tell us uh, lectures. And uh, I think I might got that idea in my primary thirties. It took me many years to get back to uh, uh, my roots because I went to uh, residential school. It had something to do with that. So it took me many years to get back to my roots where I, you know, where I was born. And, uh, and I mean, that's what I do. It's uh, mostly uh, legends and I also do uh, animations uh, about uh, legends and men. And that's one of them, I think. It's a little animation. It's probably upstairs, I think. Yeah. About seven legends uh, put together. And uh, that was added that for uh, NMB National. Film board. So that's where I am now, and I'm, you know, slowing down a little bit, but I probably will keep going until right to the end. You know, what else can I do? <laughs> you know? Um, so I've been doing artwork. All my life. I've never done anything else except art. And uh, you never do anything right? Well, I don't. When I finish my artwork that day, I could look at it again the next morning and I don't like it anymore. It should have been done better. It's always a problem with this uh, doing better all those years. So you just keep going, repeating things, trying to make it perfect. So I don't think there is such a uh, perfection with my artwork. I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, who thinks like that. Dancing Iwakamaganak. Dancing Tohtimtik. Cheryl Aranda and Zigaswan. Happy to go to Sanskrit on Mania. Nihi on Square Mr. Gosu Inu. Papas Jays. Egua. Kikano. Egua Miss Quachi was Skaigan of Chinia Maga. Saskatoon, we watch New England. So I always say that's a long-winded way of telling you I'm a half-breed and I live in Saskatoon. So, um, I want to thank the people whose place this is for being here. And I feel very emotional about that. And I think that's a good thing. I think I was told by somebody in the, Bonnie, in your territory, that unless we really f feel the the emotion, you know, then, then we're taking it for granted, you know, and and I don't want to take this for granted. This is a, just a paradise. So hi, hi, can I ask something? So my mom, you know, my my big teachers were my mom um, and my relatives and my dad a little bit. 
So my mom taught me to care and to be useful. And my dad taught me to be inventive. And my relatives taught me to share my opportunities and to share my gifts. So really grateful to them that they, that was the thing they always told me, you know, what to do. And in my early work, oof, boy, am I ever nervous, my hands just shaking. Um, in my early work, I did mostly performance art, and it's not depicted here at all, but um, I think it was because at the time I didn't have my language. I'm learning it now as an older person. And uh, the only things we had when we were kids, our mother would tell us to shut up and mm -hmm. that we were liars and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so those were the, her the words we heard when we were kids. But um, so I realized that the early performance work was me trying to find a sort of a personal lexicon with my body and materials, you know, and I was trying to say something. I was trying to express myself. And when I started learning my language, um, my desire to sort of be performing and to be making the work I was making sort of started to fade away because I realized the language, the language knew me, you know, my language knew me and, and I didn't have to do all the kind of gestures I was doing for so long. And then my relatives, you know, that teaching from my relatives, teaching me to share my opportunities started to really dawn on me, you know, as I, as I grew up and I got older, I was like, ah, okay, I know what they meant. And um, so I started moving from making work that was about me performing to work that was about other people getting to participate, about other people being the focus of the work. And, um, and that made me really happy, you know, because it meant that more people uh, were seeing themselves expressed in the work and joining in. And the thing about sharing, uh, so the other piece that, um, the first Hyde piece, um, I'll talk a little bit about that work. It's, I've been, um, uh, since 2008, going into um, provincial, correct provincial correctional centers, federal prisons, and uh, municipal detention centers. And that was the other thing, when I learned how to write songs, when I started learning how to write a song, I was like, okay, that's the gift I need to share. And so that this piece uh, is one of the works, is, is based on one of the songs. Uh, the piece is called Winter Count, but the work is, uh, the song is called Can't Break Us. And um, there's I think nine or 10 songs that have been written in various different um, correctional facilities. Because I think, speaking of when Bob Dempsey, or Dempsey Bob was talking about culture, um, and sort of being gifted and how much of it's wasted. Like, that's what I found is that our prisons are full of mostly predominantly indigenous people who are so gifted and so talented. And, and so it's been a gift for me to be able to go in and um, share my ability to write a song um, with a group of uh, individuals and um, I call them freedom songs, but not because they're part of that sort of uh, civil rights movement, but in Cree language, um, the beam sum, the beam sum, it means um, to be self-governing, to own yourself, to be your own boss. And it, it also refers to sort of being in a state of balance, you know? So, you know, it's, it's those um, women and men and youth, you know, getting to express themselves and them getting to be the boss of their words and their song. Um, so it's, you know, it's them expressing themselves and um, I know I can tell, I come from a family that knows how to make a short story long, so yeah, <laughs> somebody's going to have to give me the, the, ten, the eight minute mark. But um, when I go in, the first thing I say to, to everyone I'm working with is I say, you know what happens when you play a country song backwards? Does anyone know that joke? Mm -hmm. When you play a country song backwards, you get back your house and your dog and your wife. And so it's kind of like we could sing, we could write a song like that, but why don't we just write a song that sort of asserts who we are and what we're going to do, you know? So at any rate, okay, you're going to give me the eight minutes? All right. Um, so uh, the other piece, which isn't this one either, the, the Buffalo pieces, um, I started realizing that uh, in, in my life, when I went visiting, and in my language you say gyokgyoin, and gyokgyoin is like knowledge transfer. You know, you go to someone's house, and in that process of having that visit, you know, some knowledge has been transferred. You know, there's an interchange. 
And I started realizing that there was like stories that would be like, oh, that's an amazing story, you know, and it had a transformational effect on me. And so this piece is a, a piece about transformation and it's based on a, a story from our, our elder sibling. So in Cree language, it's not elder sibling, it doesn't say or he or she, which is interesting. It's kind of our elder sibling is a they in a very interesting way that sort of bridges the physical world and the spiritual world. So there's another dimension of they-ness, right? And uh, so on Sunday, tomorrow, I'll tell that story of, of that piece. Uh, as uh, families come and uh, join in on uh, getting to roll on the piece. So that's the thing you need to know is that take your shoes and your glasses off and, and think of something you want to change in your life and have a role, you know, and, uh, and that's what that piece is about. Um, and so finally, um, if you can switch to that final slide, I'll just say um, I'm working on something new. Um, and new in many ways for me, uh, in this notion of the way I was taught to share my, my gifts and to share my opportunities and to, and to be caring. Um, um, I got invited by some curators to make some work, um, a new work, which is more, um, more in the work of like Luc Gauchin, the kind of technological work. So it's, you know, it's image mapping and sensors and there's all kinds of, you know, algorithms that have created the images and I could go on about that, but um, it's based on the fact that uh, the curators were telling me um, about the, the falls at Ottawa. And uh, in, in Bani, in your language, what I've learned, it's called uh, Akijojuan, and it means the um, pipe, pipe bowl. So it's a sacred place. It's a pipe, oh, the bowl of a pipe, you know, it's a sacred, sacred place. And, um, but as they were speaking to me, these two curators, they mentioned something about eel ladders. And I was like, eel ladders? I've never heard of an eel ladder. What's that all about? I mean, I come from a land from a landlocked place. There's no access to 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 the oceans from northern Alberta, where I'm from, right? So eels, I, you know, we didn't have eels, and, and I had, so I had to do a lot of research uh, because there's the thing about the story. The story kind of what made me go, wait a sec. I need to hear more about this story. What, what about these eels? What about this? What is this about? And um, serendipitously, as, as I was starting to kind of be really intrigued by these eels, um, I, got to, I got invited to sing at an online symposium that was uh, Interspecies Communicators. And um, I don't know if any of you guys watch YouTube videos, but there's some amazing videos of, of interspecies communicators who talk with other beings. And, uh, and I, it's sort of one of those evening pastimes where I was like, oh, let's watch something interesting, an interesting documentary. And so I was really intrigued because some of the people that I'd been watching for years on YouTube were like in this big Zoom room. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it, it dawned on me that not only was I you know, intrigued by the story of what, what are these eel ladders and what is this place, Akijojuan, what is this pipe bowl? But I, I realized that I needed to talk to the eels. And so the project is um, based on communication, uh, working with one of the interspecies communicators, talking with the eels um, on, uh, about the project. And so it's, it's a collaboration with the eels, the work that will be in the gallery. And, the one thing that the eels um, wanted me to to oh they're so they're so darn clever. I said to the eels, I said, so how do you want me to to address you in the piece? You know, like how can I sound you? Because in my language, there's no word for eel. We have no word. And uh, and the eels, so clever, they said, why don't you check out how many human languages have a word for us? <laughs> And there's like over 200, I found, languages from all over the world that have a word for eel, for these freshwater eels. Not the lampreys, not those invasive species, but the freshwater eels. And uh, so that's going to be part of the piece, is all of these different languages from around the world. And many indigenous languages, you know, like bimeze is the word in, in, in your language, Bonnie. That maybe I'm saying it a bit wrong, but... Um, but I just want to finish with saying um, one thing the eels mentioned to me, um, because the population in that river 
is down by 98%, the eel population. And I don't have to tell anyone here what's going on looking at the news and, this, and what's happening with the salmon this year and the, the creeks and rivers drying up. But the eels, um, they're bottom feeders, so they keep, they keep the fresh water clean. And so if their population is down by 98%, it's, it's giving us a sense of what's happening to our waters. And uh, I'll just finish by saying that the eels told me that if we go, you go. So get in us, go in us. It's really hard to think about how to recap everything that you said because it's all been so amazing. Drawing back to your work in the exhibition, your practices over your lifetime work and thinking through your lifetime achievements is um, really understanding your lifelong learning and your your everyday practices and um, so many threads of what you have said uh, are incredibly humbling in thinking of the transmission of culture through intergenerations, thinking about our ancestors, transmission of culture through the things that we care about and excavating histories that need to be known. And I just really appreciate uh, all of your work and spending time with us today and sharing. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Cheryl, I just wanted to know what the eel ladder was because when you were talking about them and they sound fascinating. The eel ladders, uh, they, they're part of sort of a cons conservancy or conservation an idea that um, because they put dams wherever there is falls, and that's to generate hydroelectric power. And um, Shadir Fall, or Akijojiwan, it's the second uh, biggest uh, falls in all of North America, apparently. Uh, and so it's an important source of, of course, energy. But what happens is the eels, so this is a little research on the eels, the eels actually um, reverse spawn. So whereas salmon spawn upstream, uh, eels actually spawn in one place in the world. So all freshwater eels from all over the world spawn in the ancient seabed called the Sargasso Sea off of North Carolina. And so it doesn't matter if they're in, they go back to Maori land or Aotearoa, it doesn't matter if they go back up to Russia, to Venezuela, to anywhere in these lands, they all spawn there. And um, so these tiny, tiny little babies make their way back to the river where they came from, where their, where their ancestors have always been. And so that's their job. Uh, as they grow, they, they bottom feed and clean the waters and they head upstream. And so, of course, when they get to the falls, they actually climb rocks. And there's some gorgeous videos of tiny, they're called glass eels, if you check them out on the internet. And they actually climb up rock faces to make their way to continue to go upstream. And the interesting thing is that um, their gender is, is based on where they end up. And so it's mostly the women who end up the furthest upstream. And the men stay closer down into the estuaries. But when, when the female becomes mature, her job then is to make her way back downstream so she can go and um, spawn and in the Great Sargasso Sea. So the eel ladders are there because um, because those babies wouldn't, they would be blocked by the dam and by all of those combines and everything. So that's a, a human intervention attempt to try and allow the few that are still with us to make their way up, whether they know that, I don't think there's signposts that let the eels know that there's. So, you know, unfortunately, I think, you know, we're part of the problem of the eels not making their way up. But the but eel ladders are being used. And they have eel portals for the females, but uh, that's what the, the eels also communicated to me was that they, they don't like those the eel portals as well because they have to try to find an eel portal to make their way back down. So, hope that answers. That. I'm curious about loops, about work, and like how long does it take you to get those eels out of the water? Are you getting yeah. like years? Well, it depends on how much time. Can so building the, the most, uh, the, what takes the longest time is, is archiving the work, yeah. extracting the work, yeah. and uh, 
And then uh, we, we all do that, you know, when we were, uh, before I used to make albums with photos and mm -hmm. comments, eventually the albums become uh, spaces that get exposed. So it's been a lifetime project, mm -hmm. But the thing that changes over the years is how I organize. Mm -hmm. you know, it. When I had those scrapbooks, and it was not with me. The scrapbooks had evolved, and now scrapbooks are scrap spaces. And uh, no, I, I'm really uh, uh, intrigued and pleased to see how everybody acknowledge where we are. So I wonder in cyberspace, you know, what people acknowledge, where, where are you? But that's a, that's a good question because we're living in a way of flesh and being and we farm. Really. So when, when you are in these like, abstract spaces, what do you acknowledge? And that's, maybe that's our challenge as you know, uh, it's hard to do it without technology. Like we, we rely on our cell phones to be reachable. It just depends on somebody needs us. But saving digital images is so risky. It's so risky. 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 Risky because they deteriorate every time you open one, depending on the, on the format you use. Um, they they deteriorate eventually. Like I have a whole lot of images that I can no longer access because the format I don't know it's worth it. And things like that. With it. I'm curious, like how many? How you have to upgrade all the time. And every time you turn around, you have to you know take that into consideration. It, 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 it's just fascinating that you know how. Uh, but maybe this is a good thing that can get lost over this <laughs> room for I think it'd be one of the if I wanted to uh, to to grow up or to become more mature as a person I would accept to yeah. where things go. <laughs> and uh, because maybe it's not for me to live in the present. <laughs> Although I agree with with that's but you know and my colleagues that you know if you want to know you know, you have to have a sense of where you come from. You have to recognize your ancestors, your, your mentors, your professors, where you are, who you are with. It's very important. But um, I think it's just something for you to be in the present. That would be one of the things that I should have learned yeah. as a human being to be really present. That's why I like you know, the practice of saying, hey, I'm here. Uh, I, 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 I'm here as a visitor, uh, and uh, I, I, it's, it's not true, but it's something that you know, yeah, I get something from the blood pressure and said, you know, all that was said. But that uh, uh, you have to make it that. Nothing is given to us. We should not take anything for granted. So, but in the space, which is more abstract, the, the one that I'm offering here, yeah. we have to uh, think seriously about how to. Uh, to be welcoming, how to feel welcome there, and how to keep our humanity because of it. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, we will not survive in that. We the, 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 the system that makes us survive and healthy uh, flowers and bias and bias uh, uh, and we need to be like what we offer here. And, you know, for these few days it was to, to have a chance to, to talk with one another and breakfast and all the uh, you know kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So yeah, could technology is there but we have to do critical. Did you write the code for all of those? No, 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 no. Um so my question actually a little bit of a follow-up. Uh, it has to do with um, so when I look across the table I see, uh, you know, beautiful older faces. Mm. Okay, I'll just say it like that. So my question has to do with your personal feelings and experience about impermanence. So we're just kind of talking about that, and also on the other hand, legacy. And, and do you think about it? How do you think about it? So that's my question. Given that none of us know. What tours? Mm. Uh, what you talk about is life, right? Like, 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 how much time you got to do it, right? You know, like I, 
it hit me last summer and uh, experience and I was in the hospital for a while and it really makes you think because you always think you got a lot of time. And I realized like with my work, I've got sketchbooks full of drawings. I've been saving, you know, and I was stingy for them. But then I realized now, when the hell are you gonna do it? You know what I mean? He, time's going by, gotta do it now. And then what I realized too, my vision and what I can do and my skill, my ideas, not everybody has that. And you gotta use it and do it the best you can, as much as you can. And I'm thinking about my carving. I still got a lot of carvings I wanna do. And I, I realize my ideas too, if I don't do it, nobody else is gonna do it because nobody else sees it like I do or knows what I know. You know, like I, I've been studying art for 50 years and I've been drawing and thinking about it, you know, and I've got all these ideas and I think about it now, it's really important. It's important because people can learn from what I do and what I know. Because I was, I was really fortunate, I, I grew up with my grandparents and I listened to their stories and I listened to the, you know, and, and they taught me a lot of things, you know, because like art is not just about art, it's about life. It's about life, you gotta know life too. And you've gotta use it though. You've gotta be able to use your, your skill, your, your intelligence, because like when people look at artists' work, okay, you're looking at the intelligence. You're looking at their knowledge. You're looking at their experience. You're looking at their life. You're looking at where they're at. You're also, it's, um, you know, like I just had a retrospective and then I, I realized when I looked at my pieces, I haven't seen for some of them 40 years. I spent years by myself, years, and just working, thinking, because I had to figure out everything, every cut, every shape, every line. I drew the line, I carved the line, I painted the line, I, I thought about it, I dreamt about it. And I realized that that's all the time, and you only get so much time. And like, Artists usually do the mature work at the end. And I've been thinking about that and I'm, I'm trying to use what I know and do it the best I can with what I know. That's what I've been doing with my work. And I wanna see where it goes. Because, you know, like eventually as, as an artist, you know, you, you could learn so much, you could do so much, but eventually, like, it's a hard road. It's a road, but eventually you gotta go your own way because it's already been done. Everything's been done. Because when you try to go your own way, that's where your style is. That's where your truth is as an artist, as a human being. And that's what art is about. And she was talking about getting better. I always try to get better too. <laughs> and what I do is I don't show my stuff in my house because the faces will come back to me and they'll come out from something else. And so I hide them or I get rid of them or they're gone. And I try to forget about them because I got to do new things. I can do better things. And that's how I, that's how I work, you know, but that's what I've been thinking about too, is now what, what, what I, what, I've got to do it now. And that's what I've been doing, just working.